It's been known for a while that large theropod dinosaurs trended towards having small arms. You can see this most famously in the Tyrannosaurs, but even some other ones like the Abelosaurs had even smaller arms than the Tyrannosaurs, and that's some of what makes this new animal so interesting. Meraxes gigas was a Carcharodontosaurid coming from South America, and the Carcharodontosaurs were another group of very large theropods that lived during the Cretaceous. In fact, some of them, like Giganotosaurus, may have been even longer than Tyrannosaurus rex, so these were absolutely massive animals. And what makes Meraxes super interesting is that out of all the Carcharodontosaurs, it's really the only one that has well-preserved arms. And that's actually really exciting, because we've had a few pieces that help to suggest that the Carcharodontosaurs also had relatively small arms, but Meraxes is able to show that they were comparable in a big way to the arms of Tyrannosaurus. And when I say in a big way, what I actually mean is in a small way, because they were about the same size, meaning that they probably would have been about the length of my arm, potentially. And this is in an animal that would have been over 35 feet long, or a bit over 11 meters. So these are, again, very large animals with very small arms. What this means is that all of the different lineages of large theropods evolved their small arms pretty independently from one another. There wasn't a common ancestor of all of these groups that already had short arms and that they then inherited. Instead, as they got larger, they just happened to also shrink their arms and increase their skull size. So it's a pattern that we see quite a bit within the theropod dinosaurs. Meraxes is also more important than just this though, because it's very well preserved for a Carcharodontosaur, being better preserved than pretty much any other one, with most of the skull preserved, a number of the vertebra in parts of the neck and especially the tail, the hips, and the legs preserved, in addition to some of the gastralia belly ribs and, of course, the arms that I mentioned previously. Hopefully there will be more study with these parts of it, and with what is known of other Carcharodontosaurs to better try and figure out how they may have differentiated themselves into different niches than other dinosaurs did, like the Tyrannosaurs. But even beyond that, this means we can do a very good job of trying to place it into a phylogenetic matrix, which is essentially seeing what characteristics the bone has, and seeing how closely related it might be to other animals based on those characteristics. And in fact, it falls so finely within Carcharodontosauria, you can actually place it within the tribe Giganotosaurini. And Giganotosaurini is actually a very specifically South American clade of the Carcharodontosaurs, which makes sense. It's essentially saying that this clade evolved separately from some of the other Carcharodontosaurs, such as Carcharodontosaurus, which comes from Africa. Meraxes was found in the Huinkle Formation, which is from the early part of the late Cretaceous, just before the Carcharodontosaurs went extinct entirely. And so this really helps to highlight that there was a lot of diversity in the Carcharodontosaurs up until the point they went extinct. So why exactly they did that is really hard to tell. One way this really helps to highlight the diversity though, is because there's another Carcharodontosaur from the same formation, just from higher up in it. So essentially during the early time that this formation was being deposited, Meraxes lived. And then during the upper part of that formation, essentially the last part of it being deposited, Mapusaurus lived. And Mapusaurus potentially lived along some very large dinosaurs like Argentinosaurus. And so it's really intriguing to try and understand how some of these Carcharodontosaurs may have interacted with their environment, potentially hunting things like sauropods, or at least juvenile sauropods. Now this of course begs the question, is there actual diversity in these animals, or are we just naming different specimens different things even though they're the same thing? And that's where these researchers pointed out a few different diagnostic characteristics that show that Meraxes was different from the other Carcharodontosaurs. Some of these features include things like there's two openings with the antorbital fossa on the maxilla bone, there's a jugal bone that is stepped along the tail end of it, the postorbital bone has a low and rounded lateral horn next to the squamosal bone. Additionally, there's the hip vertebra which had almost entirely fused, and there's a large claw on the second digit of the foot, and that's when it's compared to the other toes on the foot. This combination of features and a few other features helps to show that Meraxes is entirely independent of these other Carcharodontosaurs. And in fact, it was one of the earliest diverging Carcharodontosaurs within Giganotosaurini. So what this means is if you have a single lineage that leads to Giganotosaurini, the common ancestor of all those animals, Meraxes would have branched off first, the other lineage would have kept going, and then had multiple branches within it, which led to things like Giganotosaurus and Mapusaurus. What this means is that there were multiple different lineages of Carcharodontosaurs living in South America during the Cretaceous, and these all would have been large enough to be trying to fill the dominant predator roles. 
And so exactly what was happening and how these different animals split into different niches is still really poorly understood, in part because most of them, other than Meraxes, are pretty partially preserved. So hopefully we'll get more and more research on the ones we have and be able to try and better understand what they were doing. And again, Meraxes already does a great job of at least getting our foot in the door to try and understand what exactly they were doing.